Passover is the most celebrated Jewish holiday. And the question is, why is Passover the most celebrated Jewish holiday? If Passover, when you think of it, compared to the other Jewish holidays, is not even as enjoyable. Uh, and it can't be, because we have more restrictions in terms of what we are permitted to eat than the other holidays. So why is it? And there are many ways one can suggest the possibilities of why Passover is the most celebrated Jewish holiday, even among non-religious Jews. But I think the answer to the question may very well be, at least in part, due to what we call the Manishtana. The Manishtana being the four questions. Why do I say this? Because another way to say it is called engaging with the children. So the adults, the parents engage with the next generation and it's built into the Seder, built into the holiday of Passover is the fact that parents must engage with their children. We don't find this any other holiday. So another holiday, the adults can have a party and the children can either be playing in their room or they'll do, be doing their own thing or they'll be with the parents, or they won't be. But the celebration will go on without them. But on Passover, we need to have them. They're integral to the holiday, which means that when they get older, what, is, what are they looking forward to at Pesach? That their next generation, they'll do the same thing that their parents did for them. They'll give over to the next generation too. So it creates an automatic Connection between every single Jew, regardless of your age and the holiday. Either you're at the stage of wanting to be the adult in the room, or you're at the stage of still feeling love for being the child in the room. And of course, there's the in-between stage that everyone goes through that they're not sure which part. And that's the most difficult stage to go through. It's called the teenage years. Anyways, so let's talk a little bit about the four questions. The Manishtana. Manishtana means why is it different? Why is it different? What is the origin of the Manishtana? Huh? Hebrew. Hebrew, yeah. What's the origin of this? It comes directly from the Torah. The Torah and God's brilliance. Silly thing to say. So we'll use this language just to help us understand what I'm talking about. God said that there's a mitzvah on Pesach. V'igadito lebincho. To tell over to your son. And multiple verses that says when your son will ask you what is this and you will tell him in other words your son is going to ask you what is going on in passover what's 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 happening over here and you'll explain to him that god took us out of egypt which means that god wanted the pesach celebration should be a way of telling over the story in the form of question and answer someone asks and someone answers Traditionally, it's the children who ask and it's the adult who answers. However, however, there's much more to the four questions than just engaging with the children. Much, much more. The four, the four questions go much deeper than just engaging with a child. Where do we know this from? How can we be so certain of this? So the truth is, it's very simple. What happens if you have a Seder with no children? Do you still ask the four questions? Yes. Yes. Who asks the four questions? An adult. Oh, so an adult. So you, right away you see it's not only for children. Even an adult asks the four questions. One adult asks another adult. As long as you have two people in the room. So one adult asks the other adult. As a matter of fact, you can have two of the greatest Torah scholars that are doing a Seder together, just two people. And the halacha is, the Jewish law is, that one scholar turns to the other scholar and asks him the questions. And the other scholar replies with the answer. Yes, question, go ahead. About it being the younger one? The younger one? No, this is, no, no. 
that's what that's, we do. You always yeah, have... that's just a more modern way to do things. They uh, try to keep it in a certain uh, <laughs> uh, decorum, so they have the youngest one ask. But that that doesn't come from any any real source. Uh, but let's take this one step further. What happens if you're doing a Seder alone? No one else, just a private Seder, me, myself, and I. Whatever the circumstances, this is the reality. Most interesting, we ask the four questions to yourself. Yes. So you're sitting at the Seder by yourself, mm -hmm. and you turn to yourself and you ask yourself the four questions, and you give yourself the answer. Which if we pause and stop right here, we're forced, we're really forced to say that the four questions, the whole idea, the concept of the four questions being part of the say there is much, much more significant than just having a child ask the questions. And it's even more significant than having someone else ask the questions. What's taking place at this time of the Seder the Manishtana part, when we're asking the questions, it's really a, a question that's every person is asking themselves in a certain way. And it even goes further than this. Why? Why? Why should I ask myself the question? Why don't I just hit the answer? So there's two ideas over here. There's one idea where we have to try in this evening to get in touch with a part of us that we're usually not in touch with. We're trying to talk to a certain depth within me that in usual conversations we're not we're not engaging with it's not a surface level conversation that we're having over here it's a much more personal it's a much deeper conversation that that's going to take place now so even though i'm sitting alone you can't just rush into such a thing the question is what prompts us to stop and to realize what is taking place over here what exactly am I doing here right now? Why do I have these things in front of me? Why is this night different than all other nights? Yes, I know I spent time preparing days, weeks, and I spent money because Shmura Matzah cost money and everything that goes into kosher for Passover cost money, extra money. I got that. And then while I was doing it, if you would ask me why I'm doing it, it's Passover. What do you mean I'm Jewish? It's Passover. But now that I'm actually sitting down at the table, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. Because now we're trying to experience something. We're not just trying to talk about something. And to try to experience something, we have to dig a little bit deeper within us in order to have that full experience. And that begins with the Manishtana. Where all of a sudden we're stopping, we're talking to ourselves. Why is this night different? Now, in Chabad, the custom is, regardless of the size of the Seder, how many people are there, regardless of the age of the people that are at the Seder, everyone asks the four questions. Oh. The child asks the questions out loud, and the adult says the four questions in an undertone, which means it's not only are we talking about a situation where two adults are in the room, so one asks the other, but now we're actually saying that everyone asks the questions. It's not a child's game. Or maybe it is. Why does everyone ask the questions? Why does everyone say the words of the questions? Not out loud, maybe, but at least in an undertone. Even the one leading the Seder the one who is being asked, so to speak. Even he says the four questions. Why? And the answer is because the line that the custom has become that before the four questions, 
we add an additional line. An additional line is, Father, I will ask you four questions. That's the opening line. So before you get to saying, why is this night different than all the other nights? We say, Father, I want to ask you, or I will ask you the two different versions. Can I ask you, or I will ask you four questions? What's so significant about this line? The significance of this line is that who's father? We're talking to our father, our collective father. We're talking to God. So in a sense, we're all children in the night of the Seder. Everyone is a child. Even the one leading the Seder is a child. We're all children of God. And we all turn to God and we ask God, God, why is this night different than all the other nights? So there's a dual process that's taking place over here. On the one hand, what's going on is the, the Seder. There are people. We're talking to human beings. We're engaging with children. And this is of utmost importance. Passover is all about passing on the traditions from one generation to another generation. Rearing another generation of Jewish people in the traditions that go all the way back to the time when we left Egypt. Eating the same matzah and explaining why we're eating this matzah. Commemorating the fact that we would have and we should have a Paschal lamb tonight, but we don't because the temple was destroyed. But had the temple not been destroyed, we would, we would be eating a piece of meat right now. And the bitter herbs for the bitter times when we were in Egypt. And the fact that God came and took us out of that exile. That's on one level. But there's also another process that's going on. And that is a more sophisticated one. One taking place between me and God. A conversation that's going on with me and myself. A conversation that's going on between me and Almighty God. So you have on your papers. You have the papers in front of you. Which is why I'll just conclude with one final note on this. Someone whose father is no longer alive or someone whose father isn't present at their own Seder and the question is even if their father passed on from this world already, we still open with that line, Father, I want to ask you the four questions. Because we're not only talking to the physical father, we're also speaking to our father in heaven. So we'll talk tonight at a basic level, and then we'll go at a deeper level of the four questions. So let's talk basics. The four questions. If you open up a Mishnah and the Talmud, they're different. In different Talmuds, there's actually different versions of exactly what to ask. What are the questions? How many questions were there? Our questions that we ask actually come prior, probably from the Jerusalem Talmud, and there used to be a question of why do we insist on eating this meat tonight roasted? But since we no longer eat roasted meat on Passover because we don't have the, the Passover offering. So we dropped that question. Years later, after the temple was destroyed, they added a fourth question, another question. That's to do with reclining. So let's get now to the questions themselves. On all other nights... We don't even dip one time. But tonight, we're making sure we're insisting on dipping two times. What are the two times that we're dipping? One time, the karpas in the salt water. And the one time, the morer in the charosos. So at this point in the Seder, when we ask the questions, we have already done the karpas, which means we've already taken a vegetable a potato or an onion, and we've already dipped it in salt water. Never, ever at any meal throughout the year do we do such a thing. Usually, you make Kiddush, every Shabbos and Yom Tif, you make Kiddush, 
And then you go straight to washing your hands for challah. And over here, we're making Kiddush. We're washing our hands. But instead of having challah, we're taking a, a vegetable and we're dipping it in salt water. So as an observer, as a child, immediately I'm struck with this. What's going on? Why are we dipping? Why are we not eating? What's, what's going on? The second question that we have is, on all other nights we eat, Chometz or matzah, right? You have challah, you can have matzah, you can have whatever you want. It's not on your papers yet. Not, we're, not, we're not holding the paper yet. But tonight, sorry for the confusion, but tonight we're having only matzah. Question number three. On all other nights, we eat all types of vegetables, salads, whatever you want. But tonight, we have to have more of them. You have to have the bitter herbs. Why? And the fourth question, which I said was added later, on all other nights you eat either sitting straight or reclining, but tonight we insist on reclining. This is, the way I just gave it over to you, this is the Chabad version of the four questions. Now everyone asks these four questions, but actually most in a different order. Which is... Reclining, so that means you're not like on the couch. So it used to be no. So it used to be that's the, the, that the, really they, that's how they would eat. Oh, okay. That was the aristocratic way of eating. Was uh, as a reclining, they would pass a little small table in front of you, where your where your servant would would serve you on. Um, and in the Talmud, there's much discussion, even the code of Jewish law, of removing the table from in front of you. You sit down, then you take away the table. You bring back the table. Nowadays, you can't move your dining room table anywhere. <laughs> your table is set, and you're not taking it out of the house and putting it back in the house, or uh, no one's going to be, you'll have bigger problems than just moving your table. But um, so, but yes, people would, would eat reclining. And there's, there's much discussion. We're not, it's not the subject of today of why we recline today, who reclines, um, et cetera. But the basic idea of reclining is. Since you asked, the basic idea is we lean to our left side on something. We lean on something to our left side. You can lean on the table, you can lean on the chair, you can lean back a little bit to your left side. But the idea is that we're not just, usually we're eating sitting straight up. Tonight, to remember the times of royalty, which it used to be that royalty meant that you had that recliner, etc. So we're leaning, but we don't have the whole meal that way. We have certain times of the meal, which we'll get to in a moment. So why do we specifically use this order? And there's a question on this order. And the big question is like this. The first thing we did tonight at the Seder is make the Kiddush. Kiddush is one of the four cups of wine that you drink at the Seder. When you drink the first cup of wine, they drink the Kiddush cup. So then men all recline to the left when they drink it. So this would be the first thing that a child would notice as different. The Kiddush is different. Not the words of the Kiddush, but the way we're drinking it is different. So the order seemingly should be reclining first, because that's that's what happened first tonight. The observer who's watching and noticing the things that are different tonight, they're noticing the first thing is, how are you having Kiddush like this? Usually you drink Kiddush like a normal person. You take a cup and you drink. Tonight, no, we're careful. Pillows, a table, a chair, a bench, or something. Even if you have nothing, you lean on the person next to you. You can't lean on yourself because that's not that's not reclining normally. That looks like you have a some some type of ache. So that's that should be the first question. No, it's the last question. Why is it the last question? If we're going in order, that's the order it should be in. So another type, another order you can go in is let's talk about the order of importance of these four questions. What's the order of importance of these four questions? Seemingly, if we're talking about the order of importance, the most important element of the Pesach Seder, of the night of Passover, is the biblical mitzvah that we have to eat matzah. That is the most important thing of the Seder. There's nothing that comes close to eating matzah. That's the only mitzvah that we have, biblical mitzvah we have tonight in terms of food. The other mitzvah is to tell the story of Egypt, of the exodus of Egypt. 
So if we're going to talk about that, so seemingly then the matzah should be first. After the matzah should come the next question, we should have the morer. The morer is rabbinic today, but it used to be biblical in the times of the temple. Today it's only rabbinic in nature. Fine. So we should ask first about the matzah, then about why tonight we're specifically eating more. Then you want to go further, we should have the mitzvah, we should have the question of reclining, because that's connected with the four cups of wine, which is also rabbinic in nature. And the fourth question, the last question, should be some type of tradition that we have, that we dip the vegetable in the salt water. That should come last. Mm -hmm. So why do we put that first? It's like it's so out of place. It doesn't fit in with the chronology of events, how they're taking place tonight. It doesn't fit in with the order of importance either. So why do we have that in Chabad? We insist on putting that first, that question first. I said not everybody does it, but we do it that way. Why, why do we do it this way? So there's, there's a beautiful idea. There's a beautiful idea, like everything else in Passover. Everything that we do has significance. There's nothing on Passover that's done that's just by accident that it happened this way. There's much esoteric meaning to everything that takes place. And sometimes it's not esoteric. It's, it's, it's even simpler than that. The way Jews approach Judaism, usually is like this. What's important? What it says in the Torah. Biblical mitzvahs, that's important. Of secondary importance to me, what are the early rabbis, you know, the early sages, what did they have to say? That's when you start going through everything and you ask the question, why do I do this? Yeah, this. It's a tradition that was started three, four hundred years ago. So what's my reaction to hearing that? Not so, it's, not so, it's not so significant. Which, from a certain perspective, it's true. It isn't as important in Judaism as the biblical mitzvah. It's, it's certainly true. It's just a custom. It's a tradition that we have. So usually when it comes to customs, we're very quick to dismiss customs and say, eh, Johnny, come lately. You know, who's who, the person, who, where did this custom even come from? The reason for the custom is no longer in around, so drop the custom. We're looking to rid ourselves, to disconnect ourselves from this custom. And we justify it with seemingly some type of a logical explanation of it really isn't that important. And here comes the order of the, of the, of the four questions. Tonight is all about, as I said in the beginning, if we're going to follow the theme of Jewish continuity, that it is actually the Passover Seder, the night which is emblematic of Jewish continuity of one generation giving over Judaism to another generation. So we are to realize and not make the mistake be conscious of the fact that tradition and custom is actually what holds Judaism together. It's actually the glue that keeps it all together. The first question we ask tonight is about a custom. That's the thing that the children are most attached to. The things that actually are most meaningful to them is this is the way my family does it. This is the way we this is the way we grew up. It became a part of me. This is how we do it. There's a lot of big things out there. And we do those things too, or we strive to do the big things. All good. But what is my child actually attached to? They're attached to the customs that we do. And if we show any lack of importance for these customs, not because we're disrespectful to them, but just because we're trying to maybe uh, focus on other things, we're making a mistake. It's number one. Number one priority. Giving over Judaism from one generation to another, we need to have customs. So that's the order of the, of, of the, of the questions. Now, 
1972, the Rebbe went through the Manashtana, the four questions, and the Rebbe gave a much, much deeper understanding of what's going on when we ask him the four questions. The Rebbe went through each question, each of the four questions, and zoomed out, if you will, or maybe zoomed in much more, and presented the following idea. This you have on your papers now. Let me get on the right page. You were. Yeah. yeah, it was question one. I'm trying to find it on my paper here. I didn't get myself a page four. Where, is there another? Where's there another one? Someone has two. Someone has an extra one. It's fine. Okay. All right. The way the way hold it. This is an extra one. Hold it, hold it. So I have I have another paper. Take it, don't worry. Okay. The Jewish people, the Jewish people from when we left Egypt, we lived in the desert for 40 years. After 40 years of living in the desert, we made our way to Israel. It took us seven years to conquer the land, seven years after that to finally settled the land, and we lived in the land of Israel for a few hundred years. Then we finally built a temple, which stood for 410 years. We're talking about a period of about 700, uh, 700, between 750 and 800 years that we were in the land of Israel as the rulers of our own homeland, like the land promised us by Almighty God. Then the Babylonians came and they destroyed the temple and they exiled the Jews. They took the Jews with them, most of the Jews, to Babylonia. That began the second exile, the exile of Bovel, of Babylonia. From there, that's the end of the exile was the story of Purim, which we just celebrated. We returned back, not everyone, but a, a group returned back to Jerusalem and we rebuilt temple now we have a second temple and that second temple stood the second temple stood but it but we didn't have full authority in uh in the second temple really it wasn't the same as as the first at the beginning stages of the, of the past the initial 800 years it was a whole nother ball game there were other superpowers the jewish people were not a superpower and we were really exiled at that time at different stages by by uh, by the Syrian Greeks, the story of Hanukkah, which happened about 200 years, 250 years into the second temple. And finally, after 420 years, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. The Romans destroyed the second Beis HaMikdash. And it's with this idea that we enter into a space of the four questions from a perspective of the Jewish people and exile. We have been in exile since the second temple has been destroyed. Almost 2,000 years. Just less than 2,000 years the Jewish people have been exiled from our land. All the other exiles together didn't reach even half the amount of time they were talking about now. This is the longest period in Jewish history that we've been exiled, that the Jewish people have been in exile. And the Rebbe Rashab explained that this is what we're talking about when we say night and day. Why is this night different? What's night? Night is darkness, as we'll read in a moment. Why is this night different than all the other nights? Why is this exile different? Why is this exile so different than all the previous exiles? There was no other darkness, there was no other exile that compares to what we're going through right now. Let's read During Exile. Do you have it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, source, one. Yeah, source number one. Okay, Gary, read loud so everyone can hear online. Yes. During exile, it is as if we are asleep. As it says in the Song of Songs, I am asleep. And the Zohar explains, I am asleep in exile 
because exile is compared to sleep. Sleep begins by closing one's eyes. Other parts of the body do not overtly change when we sleep. The most noticeable difference is that one's eyes are closed. Now, sight is one of the most important elements of the body, both physical sight and intellectual sight, example, foresight. When a person is in a state where he is unaware of his surroundings, he is considered asleep. When I say to somebody else, let's go back. When I look at someone, I want to know if they're sleeping or they're awake. What's the first thing I look at? Their eyes. Their eyes are closed. They're sleeping. Their eyes are open. I know they're awake, right? So that's one level. But then there's what we call the intellectual eyes. Like when you tell somebody, I see that you're making a mistake. What do we mean by that? What, is, what does one person mean when they say such a thing? It doesn't mean something physical. They're not seeing something physical that you're mistaken. But when something is clear and I'm 100% certain... It's as if my eyes are open and I see it in front of me. When I'm in doubt, when I have no idea, when I'm in darkness, I don't see anything. It's completely blocked, depending on how confused a person is. So being asleep means you're unaware of your surroundings. Being awake means your eyes are open, you see the truth, you see the reality in front of you. You can be a walking person, you can be alive in this physical world, but you're asleep to the truth of the reality that's taking place because you don't see it. You're unaware. You're living in darkness. So we don't only mean awake and sleeping physically. We're talking about these ideas we're talking about our understanding. Do we have a clear understanding or not? When someone is asleep, you dream. What's the idea of a dream? You dream of things which are many times unrealistic. They're crazy. As a saying in the Talmud, you have a dream of an elephant walking through the hole of a needle. You can dream up of anything, any imagination, Possible, right? Golos, exile is one big dream. Why is exile one big dream? Because it's impossible to understand with logic how it could be that God's chosen people, how could it be that God's beloved children should experience such atrocities the way the Jewish people have experienced? The ugliness, the torture, the dehumanization of the Jewish people for the last thousand, two thousand years is not something which we can understand. It's one big dream. It's like the impossible. If it would happen to anyone, that would already be a problem. Let alone when you'd say this is God's chosen people. These are the people that God chose to be a light on to the nations. God gave these people a mission to perfect the world, to make the world a better place. And yet, what's going on to them? What's happening to them? It's like one big unrealistic dream that's taking place. So how is this exile different than all the other exiles? How is this night different? from all the previous nights, from all the other exiles, from all the other difficult times and darkness that we lived through. Continue. Where are we holding in the... Turn the page? No, the next page. Yeah, what's the next page? Well, it's question one. Continue on question one. Let me, see, let, me see, let me see that. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, let me have page three, please. Three is on the back side. Thanks.
five is also by dipping at five, maybe? Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. Maybe there's a second. Okay, hold on to that. Exile is compared to nighttime. The fact that the Jewish people are scattered among the nations is a sign of darkness. It signifies the darkness over all people of the world in the fact that God's presence in the universe is not recognized. If that recognition would have been widespread, the Jewish people would no longer have been in exile. You understand what he's saying? The fact that the Jewish people are in exile is due to the fact, the reality of the Jewish people being, being in exile is due to the fact that the nations of the world do not see the reality of God's existence. For if they, if non-Jews, would openly see God and recognize God, they would never be able to take God's chosen people and treat them the way they're treating them. So they're living in a darkness. They're living in a confusion. Because of that, the Jewish people are suffering. It also signifies a darkness among the Jewish people because the exile is the result of our sins. Now, we've experienced many different exiles. In addition to the exile in Egypt, we were exiled by the Babylonians, by the Persian Medes, by the Syrian Greeks. Today, we are in our final exile. There's no doubt that this final exile is different. But in this regard, the child asks, Manishtana, what makes this night different than all the previous nights? When the Jewish people live in Israel, when the temple stands, when the Jewish people go to the temple and they experience open miracles, this is called for the Jewish people, we're living in daytime. We're living in, a, in an era where it's light where you can see unobstructed God's open miracles, God's presence in this world. Golos exile, on the other hand, is where we find it difficult to see and experience and relate to and connect with Almighty God. It's hard for us to determine, am I on the right path or am I not on the right path? Where am I heading and what direction am I going? What do I do to protect myself from the obstacles that are along the way on the journey? In a spiritual sense, we're, we, we're always questioning ourselves. What is the best way for me to attach to God? What is that path that I should be on right now? What do I need to do to have that real experience which uplifts me and resonates with deep within me? It permeates my my being. We're all yearning for that, but we're in darkness. We're in exile. Now let's get on to the explanations. What are the specifics of the first question? So let's read the first question. Brandon, take it away. On all nights, we do not dip even once, but on this night, we dip twice. The first unique element of this final exile is that on all other nights, we didn't dip. The Rev. Rashab explains that dipping is an expression of cleansing and purification. On all other nights, we didn't even dip once. In other words, we weren't fully cleansed, for they were followed by further exiles. On this night, however, we will dip twice. Our body will be refined and our soul revealed. To explain this in simple terms so that even a child, the questioner, could understand, we dip items into water or other liquids to cleanse them from unclean matters. Even a young student knows that Torah speaks as bathing in water and becoming pure. In other words, dipping is a form of cleansing. This is also true on a spiritual level. When we do something that is forbidden, and even a child knows that he might occasionally do something wrong after being enticed by a friend, etc., we need to cleanse and purify ourselves from that deed. How do we dip twice? Our deeds take on two forms. There are acts of the soul and acts of the body. In simple terms, some sins are associated with eating and drinking, like eating forbidden foods, failing to recite a blessing, and so on. Those deeds are associated with the body, but some deeds are associated with the soul, such as the obligation to recite the Shema, where we confirm our belief in God and our love for him. Oh. We therefore need to be dipped twice to cleanse ourselves from sins of the body and the soul. 
This is the meaning of the question. On all nights, we did not dip even once, but on this night, we dipped twice. Other exiles were followed by incomplete redemptions, indicating that the Jewish people weren't fully cleansed and purified, and therefore reverted back to exile a short time later. But this final exile will be followed by a final and complete redemption, when all evil and pain will be abolished from existence. This indicates that our exile has the qualities of a double dipping, which represents complete purification for both our bodies and our souls. In the Rebbe Shab's words, our bodies refined and our souls revealed. This is an unbelievable deep teaching that the Rebbe Rashab gives us over here. We're talking about the Jewish people as a whole going through a purification process. Exile is a purification process. It's a process of cleansing. But apparently, it's obvious to us with hindsight that the previous purification processes failed. Why? Because it was only dipped once. It didn't capture the entire existence of every single one of us. And therefore, tonight, we're going to dip twice. In other words, in this current exile that we're in, we need to have a double purification. Body and soul will immerse and will come out clean and ready for a final redemption. The second question, that's the first question of the Manishtana. The second question of the Manishtana is about Chomets and Matzah. Chomets represents arrogance. Matzah represents humility. The difference between Chomets and Matzah is that Chomets rises. Once it begins to rise, it's Chomets. Matzah, what makes Matzah unique is the fact that we don't give it a chance to rise. We bake it before the dough has a chance to rise. Now we get to the depth of the question. In all other nights, which means in all the previous exiles, we didn't fully rid ourselves of our arrogant character traits. But this exile we will leave in total humility. We will be totally cleansed of any form of evil, which evil only attaches itself to arrogance. Someone who has zero arrogance will never sin. Someone who is totally devoted, totally given over to the will of God doesn't sin. Only someone who feels themselves, feels their own needs, feels like they want to fulfill that need, fulfill that desire, fulfill that passion. So the source of all sin is chametz. The arrogance, the feeling of oneself. So continue reading, Brandon. Question number two. On all nights we eat comments or matzah, but on this night we eat only matzah? This is followed by the second question. On all nights we eat comments or matzah, but on this night we eat only matzah. Comments and matzah differ in the fact that comments rises, which signifies a perception of self-worth self and arrogance, which is the source of all evils. A child knows that as a result of arrogance, he may disrespect his teacher or parent, and he may even come to disrespect God. Matzah, on the other hand, represents humility and unpretentiousness. So the question states, on all other nights we eat chametz or matzah. The other exiles didn't conclude with a complete redemption, which indicates that we were left with the residue of chametz. But at the end of this night, with the arrival of the true and final redemption, redemption which won't be followed by another exile, it will be only matzah, cleansed of all chametz, for evil will cease to exist. The third question. The third question is about the mortar. And every other night we eat all types of vegetables. Tonight we have to have mortar. Vegetables, different types of vegetables represent the pleasures derived from food of this world. Mortar, on the other hand, represents the absolute lack of pleasure. When we say in previous exiles and all other nights in previous exiles, we eat all different types of vegetables. What we're saying is we retain our sense of pleasure and materialism. Tonight, meaning when we're going to leave this exile, this night is different. The night that we're in now is different. How is it different? Or only more in this night. We are working on rising beyond transcending our sense of physical pleasures. 
We're working on becoming a transparent, beautiful, shining, godly agent in this world. We're the only thing that gets us going. The only thing that we feel, the only thing that we sense is God's strong and powerful light. Materialism is insignificant to us. We're totally beyond that. We've transcended that. In Yiddish, we would say, Narashkait. It's nonsense. As I mentioned many times, in life we have things that we do. That we, in the moment, they're significant to us. They taste good. They feel good. We're interested in them. So many things we do to waste time, to watch this, to watch that, to go here, to go there. Even if they're pleasure, why not? It's pleasurable. I like sports. I like music. So I'm going to go to a game. I'm going to go to a concert. I'm going to watch this show, comedy, whatever it is. All because it's 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 something that I enjoy. Tell someone that it's stupidity. What are you talking about? It's stupidity. It's not stupidity. I enjoy it so much. Okay. What happens when? Your boss tells you, and I want to give you a, I want to give you a raise, but I want to give you a little bit more responsibilities, and you have to start staying in, in the office a little bit later at night. So you're gonna come home a little later. You're gonna be a little bit more tired, and your whole schedule is gonna be reworked. So you're gonna tell your boss, I'm sorry, but I have, I insist, I have to go, once a week to the concert, and I must watch this television show, because I can't live without it. It's so important to me. Or are you going to say, the hell with the TV show, I'll take the raise, I'll take the promotion. It becomes insignificant to you. It becomes nourished when there's something of more value placed in front of you. What happens when you have a wedding, celebration, a bar mitzvah, a bris, whatever it is. I'm going to a wedding, my brother, my father, my own wedding. But on the night of the wedding, there's a TV show that I love. There's a band that I love that's coming to town. Everyone, I'm sorry, we're going to postpone the wedding because I have to go watch the, my band now? Sugar, why? As much as I say that I love this and I care about it, it's insignificant. Because right now I'm in a totally better place than that. That becomes nourished to me. I'm going to a wedding of my, of my relative. I'm going to something that's so much more important in my life than, than, than all that. So what, yeah, last week it was important to me. But really it's Essentially, it's not Rashkaif. It's not really important. What's really important is being at the wedding and celebrating with my family. What's really important, God forbid, is there's a loss in the family to go to the funeral, to go to the shiva. These things are what's really important. I called someone up to go to uh, to the basketball game when we went to the to, to the game. I called him up. I invited him to come to the game. So he tells me, "What night of the week is it on?" It was a Tuesday. I mean, Tuesday night. He tells me, Tuesday, I'm sorry, I can't go. Why? I have a class that I attend every single Tuesday, a Torah class that I attend every Tuesday. <laughs> and I don't, and I don't break going to the Torah class for anything. You really want, I really appreciate it. If it would be any other night of the week, I definitely would take you up on the offer. But I don't break going to the Torah class for anything. So, no thank you. And I hung up the phone and I was so impressed. Wow. I know this person. I was very surprised. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very, very happy that he's reached a point in his life where this is of importance to him that what you, a basketball game, going to, to, to get invited to go to a suite, etc., this was of insignificance to him as compared to a Torah class. We live in a material world. So we're, we engage with materialism. We take pleasure from the material world. Yes. But there reaches a point where when you're attached with Hashem, everything becomes, it's, it, who cares? They say the story of the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe once invited, had a coming for Shabbos, a very special guest, one of his colleagues, a holy tzaddik.
So he's coming Friday night to eat in his house. So a whole fight broke out in the kitchen. What was the fight? The fight was like this. Usually the daughter, the Rebbe's daughter would prepare the fish. So the Rebbe's daughter said, for the special guest, I'm so happy, I'm honored, I'm going to have the, to prepare the fish. But his wife said, in honor of the special guest, I want to have the honor of preparing the food this time. So it's my house, my kitchen. I get to, uh, uh, there's a debate between mother and daughter. So what do you have? What, what are you going to do? They came to the Alter Rebbe. Came to the Alter Rebbe. And he said, a big debate, his wife and his daughter. Who gets the honor of preparing the fish for Shabbos? The Alter Rebbe listened to both sides and he said, listen, my daughter, she makes the food every week, so she's entitled to make the food this week. My wife, it's her home, it's her kitchen. She's also entitled. So this is what we're going to do. My daughter, you get to make them fish, but don't put in the salt. Fish without salt doesn't taste good. So my wife, you're going to be the one to put in the salt, so you'll get a share, and she'll have a share in it, and together it will be just delicious. Fine. That's what they made. That's what they decided. The daughter made, made, made the fish, but she's so used to making the fish with salt, she forgot she's not supposed to put in the salt. So she put in the salt, so she made the fish with salt. Perfect. After his wife came in, saw the fish, said it's her job to put salt in. So she went and dumped in the salt. So it's fantastic. So what do you think the fish tastes like now? And a, 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 double, uh, a double dose of salt. It was, uh, it was inedible. They came to serve the, they came to serve the fish Friday night. And uh, they brought the fish out to the to the table. They served the guest. They served out the Rebbe. Everyone's sitting down to eat. The Alter Rebbe takes a bite from the fish. He's eating it. And he gives a look and he sees the guest. He's not touching the fish. He, he's not eating it. He couldn't eat it. So the Alter Rebbe thinks that it must be there was no salt put in the, into the fish. They must have forgot to put the salt. So he took some salt and he put all, he started sprinkling salt all, all over the fish. So he added salt to his fish. The other guy's fish, the next thing you know, the salt is... Covered it, the fish is covered with salt to make it tasty. And the guy's not the Rebbe is eating. She so turns to him and he says, Well, I thought it was, but why not eating the fish? So, what do you mean? How, how are you eating the fish? This fish, you can't eat it, it's inedible. There's so much salt, you can't eat, you can't put it in your mouth. She said, turns to the other, he said, How are you eating the fish? Al Rebbe responded something to the effect that from the days when he met his teacher, the Magad of Mezrich. When he went to the Magad of Mezrich, he has lost all of his taste from food. Any physical pleasure from food, he has transcended that. He didn't taste it. He simply didn't taste the fish. This is the level that we're talking about of Mar. Mar is a time where you don't taste, you don't have any physical pleasure from materialism. In all previous exiles, the point, the purpose is when you leave exile, the now is going to be a redemption. What's the redu What's the peak? What are we aiming for? We're going to be attached to Hashem. Then we're going to forget about Narishkeit. The previous times it was tried and failed because we went back into exile. But this last exile, we're going to leave in a state of more meaning, in a state of total dvekas, total attachment to Hashem, that we'll, we will have transcended the physical pleasures of the material world. Question number four. Roslyn, you want to read the question or Mark, who wants to go? Mark or Roslyn? Huh? On all go. nights we eat sitting upright or reclining, and on this night we all recline. This is followed by the fourth question. On all nights we eat sitting upright or reclining, and on this night we all recline. Both sitting and reclining are positions of rest. A child knows that after standing for a while, he gets tired and needs to sit down to rest. But there is a distinction between the two positions. Sitting isn't true rest. It is a midway position from which you can easily stand if necessary. Reclining, on the other hand, is the expression of true, uninhibited freedom. This is the difference between this exile and the previous ones. 
some redemptions were longer, reclining, and some shorter, sitting. But they always knew that another exile could come in its wake, so even the longer redemptions weren't true freedom. Only the final redemption, which will not be followed by another's exile, will be a true rest from the exile. And then we will all recline and will achieve true rest. Okay, so the difference between sitting and resting, sitting and reclining, is the fact of how mobile you are. When you're reclining, if you want to move, first you have to get sit up, and then you can get, get up and move. But if you're sitting up, all you have to do is stand up and you're on the go. So the idea of reclining is a much more permanent position than the idea of just sitting down. So this exile is going to lead us to a final redemption, a total and final redemption, a state of kulanu misubin. We can relax forever. We're, no, we're not running anywhere after that. So this is how this exile is different than all the previous exiles, which begs the following question, the greatest question of them all. How is this possible, the child asks. Why will this next redemption be different than all the previous ones? Why, asks the child. Fine, I get it. It's going to be. You're telling me it's going to be. Why is it going to be this, uh, this way? How are we going to merit to have this idea of double sense of purification, double dipping, that both the body and the soul will be fully immersed, coming out 100% clean, to reach a state of kulei matzah, 100% humility, no chomet, zero arrogance, to reach a state of moror where everything, all the physical pleasures taste like moror to us, we have no pleasure in them whatsoever. To finally, the fourth question of fully recline, kulonu misubim. How is this going to be different? Why is this redemption going to be different than all the redemptions up until this point? And the answer is, we have to go back to Egypt. To understand this, we have to go back to Egypt. This is what we say in the Haggadah. We were slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt. When the people of Israel were servants to the Pharaoh in Egypt. Stop for a moment where we are today and try to put yourself in their mind, in their heart, while they were living in, in Mitzrayim and exile. As we spoke last week, they were completely immersed in Egypt. They were totally immersed in the culture. They were totally broken in terms of being Jews. They were totally lost. And the expression used is like they, they were enveloped in Egypt like a baby in the, his or her mother's womb. They needed to be removed. They needed to be extracted one nation from within another nation. This was quite a difficult task. And you can imagine they asked the following question. How in the world is God going to do this? This is impossible. It's an impossibility over here. Any realist said to themselves, this is ridiculous. We're never going to get out of here. How are we going to ever get out of here? Physically, spiritually, you name it. There's just no way out. There's no, absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel because there is no other exit. This is, tunnel is a dead end. We're stuck in here forever. And what did Almighty God say? Or better, what did Almighty God do? God came along and he didn't leave one Jew behind. He took them out the moment he promised he's going to take them out. He took them out. In the words of the Torah, with a strong arm and an outstretched arm. And the same thing is going to be for us in this final redemption, in the future redemption. The verse says, 
as in the days of the exodus of Egypt, I'm going to show you wonders with the coming of Mashiach Sidkein. We asked the question, how is it going to be possible? You want to know how? To understand how this is going to be possible, you have to understand that the exodus from the exile in Egypt was also an impossibility. It also made no sense. There was also no way out over there. But it happened. And the fact that it happened is why we're celebrating now. And know this, that the future redemption is also going to happen. How is it going to happen? If you're a realist, you say it makes no sense that it's going to happen. The odds are stacked against us. We're scattered all over the world. We're assimilated all over the world. Most Jews don't even identify as Jews in the year 2024. How is God? That's not our business. The same way it wasn't our business then, how it's going to happen. When the right time came, God took us out. That's it. Tonight it's going to happen. At midnight, God struck. In morning, as soon as the sun showed its beautiful light, the Jews were on their way marching out of Egypt. The exact, way, the exact same thing is going to happen. At the right time, God's going to strike. And we are going to get out of this exile. We will exit a state of darkness where we're confused and we don't see the reality of God's existence. All of a sudden, God's going to turn on the light in the world. And as soon as God turns on the light in the world, it's not going to be for us, for the world. Non-Jews are going to see God's light. What's the first thing they're going to do? They say, Jews, goodbye. <laughs> Go to where you belong. We want to help you. We want to assist you. We want God's glory to remain in this universe. That's the ultimate level. God's not going to break the non-Jews like he struck Egypt and broke Egypt. God's going to turn on the light. It's going to be daytime now for everybody. And automatically, the Jewish people will have a complete, a complete redemption from this exile. So this gives us a very deep and powerful message into the four questions. It takes the questions from a simple explanation dealing with physical things like matzah mar and reclining, etc., and brings it to a whole communal level of the Jewish people and a historic level of the Jewish people. And this is what we're doing tonight. It's not one or the other. It's multiple things happening at the same time. Everything at the Seder is like an onion which has multi-layered, many, many layers to the onion. They're all true. They're all a reality. We celebrate Passover on one level, one of these levels, and we try to incorporate into our Pesach experience as many as we possibly can. We try to go as deep as we possibly can. So hopefully tonight, everyone walks away a little bit wiser and smarter to be able to focus on one of the big highlights, if not the big highlight of the Seder, which is the four questions, the Manishtana. And now... Anyone have any questions? Good question. Uh, anyone have any questions?